Hi, welcome and thank you for spending a slice of your Tuesday with us for the first webinar in our Icentia Introducers series. Uh, a quick bit of housekeeping before we get into it. We've muted all of your microphones so we won't pick up on any background noise wherever you may be joining us from today. That doesn't mean that we don't want to hear from you though. Look for the question mark icon on the right hand side of your screen to ask a question. There's also a speech bubble icon that allows you to enter the chat area which is also on the right hand side of your screen. Um, ask any questions as you go, and we'll have uh, plenty of time at the end uh, to answer them. Um, okay, so today you're in for a real treat as I sent you, introduces you to uh, Pulsar's brand reputation. You're going to hear uh, today first from Jake Stedman, who is the VP of Research and Insight at Access Intelligence. Then we're going to spend most of our time today in the skillful hands of Rob Parkin, who is Pulsar's VP of Research. I sent you a CX director, who most of you will already know, Ali Garrett, is here to help facilitate. And for those who don't know me, I'm Russ Horrell, I sent you as Chief Commercial Officer. Before we jump into what I wanted to do some scene setting and provide you with some further context on why we're here today, Icentia has recently merged with Access Intelligence. Effectively, this means that uh, instead of being owned by shareholders on the ASX, Icentia is now owned by a single company with a growth mindset and global leadership aspirations. Access Intelligence is a UK-based MarTech leader who helps communication communicators and marketers anticipate and adapt to what is important to their customers, stakeholders, and brand. Acquiring Icentia as part of a bold plans to be the global leader in media intelligence. It means that as an Icentia customer, you can broadly expect a product offering that gives you more choice with a broader geographical reach. We will continue to invest in what we do best, but we will also provide you with new global capabilities applied with a local approach. As you can see on the screen, Icentia becomes a company that sits alongside the likes of Vulio, Response Source, and Pulsar. Vulio provides monitoring, insight, engagement, and evaluation tools for politics, editorial, and social media. Response Source is a network that connects journalists and influencers to the PR and communications industry. And Pulsar is the market leading audience insights and social listening platform. It's all your digital audiences in one place, giving you access to your own social media analytics, global social trends, and the most powerful way to understand social audiences at scale available. Today, we're gonna to hear more from Jake and Rob on how we can help you to measure your how your brand is performing online in this six part series running every fortnight um, through to the end of the working year and starting us off in the next. We will have a similar webinar that focuses on interesting new ways that our new global company can help you to overcome issues and seize new opportunities. All right, that's enough from me for now. I'm gonna hand you over now to the delightful Jake Stedman. Thanks, Russ. Hey, everyone. Nice to meet you. Um, yeah, as Russ said, I'm Jake. Um, I've actually recently joined the business. I'm the Global Vice President of Research and Insights um, at a group level. I just want to talk to you briefly a little bit about who I am, um, who we are as a company and the journey we're on. And then I'll hand over to Rob, who will talk you, to, talk you through the specifics of today's presentation around our EREP tool. So firstly, a little bit about me. Um, as I said, I'm new to the business. Um, uh, I've actually been involved and aware and working with Pulsar and Access Intelligence from, from the get-go. Um, I'll tell you a bit about more and where that relationship started in a minute. But I spent 20 years as a buyer of this kind of work, um, as a buyer of re research and insight. Um, most recently, I worked at Twitter, Global uh, Vice President of Research and Insight Twitter for eight years, where it's my job to really help scale this kind of work um, and, and the buyers of this kind of work um, on that side. Uh, and then for the last two years, I did the same role at Deliveroo. So I know what it takes to buy this kind of work and why people buy this kind of work and the impact it can have in organizations like yours. Um, and really, I, I wanted to touch on why I'm specifically here and now, because I think this company is doing really interesting work. There's no one better doing orders intelligence work, more interesting work in this space at this time, which is why I'm here and why I'm super excited to be part of this team. So who are we? We're an audience intelligence company. We had our origins in qualitative work. So actually, when I first got to build a relationship with the team here, the team were a, a team of qualitative researchers. Uh, and the brief we were writing, I was at O2 at the time, was really recognizing that insight and social data was going to be the future as an insight tool. But there wasn't really any tools out there that were doing this kind of work at a robust, scalable way that insight people like myself needed to have a kind of confidence in the data. So we built a brief, we wrote a brief and we went out to market. And that was where we met the guys at Pulsar who built this tool with us. Um, it's a super powerful, really insightful tool that really helps connect brands to their customers to understand their audiences. 
Next slide, please. So what we offer, there's two parts to our offer. The first part is our platform. So we have our Pulsar platform, which allows you to design and run your own studies, search your own data sets, do your own analysis. Um, I've been a user of that platform for 10 years, super powerful, super um, useful as, a, as an insight professional to really always understand what's going on in my market with my customers. But there's also a second side to our business, which is the research team. That team is led by Rob, uh, and I'll hand over at this point to let Rob introduce himself and the work that his team does. Thanks so much, Jake. Thanks so much. So yes, uh, my role as VP of research here at Pulsar. I oversee the teams in the US and the and the UK, um, and where we come in in terms of our of our client relationships and our and our value add. So. We come either um, alongside, or in parallel, um, or on top of um, data which our clients are having access to via Pulsar platform, so the SaaS side of the business offering. That means that we are working to build um, custom frameworks on top of the data. We're there for um, data management and quality assurances, and ultimately we're there to um, apply our expertise in the industry um, to be able to get the most meaningful insights and findings extracted from the data and then present that back to our clients. Um, traditionally in, in um, PowerPoint research deliverables on periodic or ad hoc um, deliverable schedules. We're working with our clients with, uh, with the data that is accessible to them on the platform, meaning that the work that we are doing to um, improve and harness the data is there for their clients to access on an ongoing basis. And it also means in terms of data transparency as well, everything which we are finding and discovering with the sources of data which we have are also there for our clients to interrogate and investigate for them for themselves. Um, so the kinds of work um, and the research services which we offer our clients fall somewhat neatly into four areas um, and starting off we just would have an overview of the kind of work that we do we work heavily in consumer and conversational trends so data every sorry data driven discovery as well as forecasting in terms of volumetrics uh, data which we're seeing and be able to understand emerging uh, and existing topics of conversations and themes been able to take a future facing view on where you want to focus your efforts and where you want to pay more attention to uh, in the near and medium term. We're working with audience intelligence, so very much weave through a lot of work that we do, and you'll see on a number of slides which we're going through today exactly what some of that work can look like. We're working in terms of audience discovery, so clustering and profiling online audiences and social media audiences. Um, working with interest-based segmentations to understand uh, the who behind the, the what in terms of uh, activity that is taking place online around your brand, industry, um, or category. We're working in marketing measurement, um, so being able to track performance of channels or specific campaigns, ultimately trying to understand uh, the impact that your, you as a brand or our clients are having in, in shaping online conversations. Uh, and how much impact or visibility or impressions the content you are publishing online um, via your social channels are, are reaching. And then finally, the area which we're going to focus on specifically today, brand planning and reputation. So uh, what we're going to be coming through in terms of a quick synopsis and an overview now, understanding our own reputation framework. Um, and how we're using that and AI models to structure data from social media in the same way that you would do um, and in the same structure and format as you would have your survey-based brand trackers. So trying to understand exactly how we're doing that, why we're doing that, uh, where the value uh, the, the can serve for, for you within your, within your ongoing needs can be. How are we approaching all of our work? Um, so brand planning and reputation, yes, but um, generally all the work that we're doing for our clients. Um, we are approaching the conversational analysis. Um, so in terms of that conversational data that is shared online, so the topics um, and the content that people are sharing. So what's being said, um, applying smart analysis framework. So looking at the data as a whole isn't sufficient. What we can do is start to understand how we can structure the data in a meaningful way to start to extract specific emotions as they're um, conveyed online. Anything with regard to behavior or intent 
Um, and then a lot of work that we do was around journeys as well. So I've spent quite a lot of time working for healthcare um, organizations to understand patient journeys and how their emotions of the patients um, uh, differ and alter along um, treatment processes. Um, we're working with audience analysis with a lot of areas that we do, not just specifically within the audience um, intelligence specific dimension, um, but understanding demographics and affinities. So what information can we extract from people's social profiles? What information can we affirm um, to tell us more demographic information and breakdowns? The affinity segmentation, so what are our audiences um, aligned to, what are their interests, what media outlets do they follow, um, and understanding um, and studying um, content diffusion and how information spread. So not all audiences are built the same, their passion points, their interests and what brings them into the conversation differs, and a lot of the network structures that are in place help us understand how content and information can and will travel through them. And then the holy grail for what we do at the bottom there, the primary research, whether it be um, audience analysis in which we're looking to overlay with segmentation studies or align with segmentation studies, or whether it's the smart analysis frameworks of conversation analysis, where we're looking to bring greater harmony with um, existing survey um, and branch trackers, which you may be running. The holy grail is taking social data and not seeing it within a silo, and not seeing it as independent and separate from everything else that is taking place, but ultimately with that smart analysis frameworks and with our tried and tested ways of working, bringing that greater level of synergy and harmony to everything else which uh, you as a research or a, a research buyer um, will be managing. So why brand planning and reputation um, and why social and why our methodology specifically? So to start with, um, to talk about impact, so opinions are distributed, network and amplified. So those social structures which are formed online, um, helping to um, ensure that information, opinions spread online, um, basically as well at a large scale. It's worth noting at this point that the data sets that we're dealing with can be very large from hundreds of thousands plus. Um, and it's really important to understand now more than ever how quickly and how um, how the online audiences and the networks that have been structured can help amplify that message um, and basically been able to keep greater um, management on top of um, that content as it as it flows. So the speed at which reputation ebbs and flows, um, the same networks which we just mentioned with regards to amplification, um, also helping to facilitate a very quick spread of them. Um, um, perceptions and uh, and content online. Ultimately, something that can not be won, but only ever constantly managed. Um, now more than more than ever. So what you need is something that can and a solution that can deal with the size and the scale, um, but also the speed. Um, so you're looking for something which is real time. Uh, we're working to build our programs alongside quantitative trackers, but what's happening in between those periods of reporting? what's impacting in between those months or those quarterly basis with regards to brand reputation. Um, how can we help you keep always on and always plugged into the activity as it evolves? And then in terms of opinion stratification, so heavily stratified conversations online accessible for public to see. There isn't anything in terms of a, a monolithic perception which is going to be perceived online or shared online. Um, there's going to be a, a high degree of, of variation and differentiation within the different themes which we're seeing. So, so we need something for size and scale. We need something to deal with the real-time nature and the speed. But we also need a framework in place to be understanding exactly what those different dimensions are and how they're playing out um, to be able to kind of like dig deeper into the more nuanced detail. We worked a lot with the clients over the past 12 months plus um, with regards to the change in landscape for brand communications. So I'm going to say post COVID, but fully aware that there's not a whole lot post for about COVID in a lot of areas right now. We're still very much in, um, but also post um, George Floyd and Black Lives Matters, change in the landscape of brand communications online and the need to be um, communicate greater authenticity with regards to the values, but also a high level of inter integration and sorry, interrogation with regards to how you're um, attempting to proceed online 
meaning there's a fine line between success and, and, and backlash. Um, so if we bring all these three areas together, then we're going to go through exactly what some of the solutions look like and some of our deliverables um, to be able to understand how we can help you keep on top of those three areas. So first and foremost, what you probably think of when you hear social listening. From a traditional standpoint and also a lot of solutions which you will get with regards to social listening and brand reputation, um, certainly if you Google those words, very heavily based on conversation volume, so all mentions of a brand, and sentiment, so thinking about three areas um, in terms of neutral, negative, and, and positive, it can take you a very long way in a lot of areas and still fundamentally important to the work that we do, but too simplistic um, and not able to capture all the detail that we, we require, and also a very difficult um, job to match up with regards to, um, say, overall business performance or share price. Um, but what we are saying is that we take these two areas, so conversation volume, um, we improve on it by understanding exactly what it is that we should be listening to. It might not be the whole of a brand conversation. We comply analytics to be able to um, weight and score individual pieces of the content and content as a whole to be able to understand not even not beyond what the volume is, but what the impact is online. And then sentiment. Um, so yes, can be a powerful tool, but based on the what we were saying previously with regards to the stratified opinions and how um, nuanced and detailed that can be, that kind of more binary, positive, negative, neutral, isn't going to capture all the all the detail which you which you need. Um, how we approach it and how we how our um, methodology and how our tool is slightly different. So first and foremost, what are we plugging in? Yes, we're plugging in predominantly brand mentions. So it would be your brand and your competitive set. Um, but we're using industry specific AI um, and models to classify data as we're capturing it in real time. So it's it's AI as well. So it's um, it's trained and it's improving and, and always um, getting better with the more data that we're passing through. Um, but ultimately what we're saying is we don't take every single brand post and then take that into the reporting and the analytical process. What we're doing is using our AI models to classify data before we bring it into the platform to say either is or is not relevant to reputation. We don't want to be measuring everything with regards to a brand if it's not giving us anything meaningful in terms of a value add. So the work, the data which we're analyzing is, is known to be specific to uh, reputation. And then what we're doing is using further AI models trained to brand and industry specifics. Um, so very much um, trained and custom and specific to your brand uh, and your industry to then go into the um, reputation scoring system. Um, and each individual piece of content, um, albeit even if we're dealing in hundreds and thousands of plus pieces of content, each individual piece of content is, is measured and weighed accordingly. Um, with regards to the, the reputation dimensions, which we're going to show um, shortly. So we're able to look at the data set as a whole and aggregated, but we're able to also look at individual pieces of content to understand the impact they've had on overall brand reputation. And we're able to apply frameworks on top of that as well to say a segment of conversation that is over here, which is 20% uh, of the overall um, uh, brand conversation is having a more positive or negative impact on overall brand reputation than the remainder. Um, so just giving us a greater level of um, customization um, with a framework which we can apply. And as it's happening all in real time as well, um, being able to do so and work with the data on a weekly, bi-weekly, um, as well as longer periods of research, such as monthlies and quarterlies. Um, and then the framework which we're applying to the data. So I mentioned the holy grail of making everything that we do um, greater harmony and synergy with um, existing work streams. So for anyone familiar with the RepTrack rep track approach to reputation, these areas will already start to jump out as being familiar. But what we're doing is working with those reputation dimensions. So we are building syntax, which organizes the data as it comes through into the platform, already scored by our reputation um, algorithm to say, if we've got something that's specific to leadership. So maybe there's keywords in the data which we are able to identify, people talking about your uh, leadership team, your CEO, then we know 
as opposed to just reputation as a whole across the brand and that is also relevant to the leadership dimension or is it people talking about um, workplace and treatment of employees or is it people talking about your products and services um, and then once we have that we're able to understand how that relates to any supportive behaviors so overall what's the kind of like impact ex expressed by those reputational dimensions so if people are talking about your products and services is it something that is also coming through with a message talking about intent to buy is it coming through with something that is um, saying positive something positive about your brand if it is with regards to um, the technology and the innovation is it doing more um, in terms of um, uh, audiences online expressing the intent to invest in the brand in the future um, and again because we're looking at every individual piece of content and aggregated a mass as a whole we can dig deeper into each and every one of these as well to understand what the conversations and the nuanced deal detail that exists behind these metrics are. So we can then go in to investigate the topics of conversations and the themes, the events that might be driving um, a fluctuation in these in these numbers and these dimensions. And we can overlay audiences as well. So we're already knowing um, that some of these dimensions which we reference are going to be more specific to say uh customers and others within like industry um specific experts um but we can test that with the data to be able to understand exactly how it's performing online at any given time how this looks like in terms of our reporting solution so each and every individual content um already applied with the reputation scoring system um each and every individual piece of content weighed on a normative scale from zero to 100 we're applying Bayesian algorithms um, just to smooth over the um, metrics as a whole and been able to understand that what we're looking at isn't going to be skewed by smaller audiences, highly vocal, or isn't going to be skewed by um, smaller new um, emerging events. We've basically been able to um, infer with greater competence what we're saying is, um, is, is yes, worthy of being classified as reputation, but also something that is worth the brand knowing at any given time. We're working on a periodic basis with ongoing reporting. So one of the biggest um, and most valuable means of doing any work like this will be to do it on an ongoing basis to understand not only um, how you're performing right now um, and how you're performing right now stacked up against your competitive set, but how is that evolving over time? So the example that we can see here is showing us uh, the reputation score with regards to each of the dimensions. And you can see the leadership was forming strongly in 2020, but then taking the dip in Q1 2021. So that we're then going to go into the data. Uh, our team of analysts and researchers is going to investigate and interrogate all the data to understand what's the difference in the conversation between 2020 and Q, Q1 2021. Is it a fact that there's a decline in positivity? Um, and there's a theme which was existing in 2020, which is no longer occurring, or is it um, an overall drop in volume and a slight increase in some negativity, which is causing that? Ultimately, our analysts and team of researchers telling is what telling you what it is you need to know based on what we're seeing in the data and building that reputation um, framework and program for research on an ongoing basis. Um, how we might apply that to specific use cases so we can apply um, separate keyword clustering um, and we can analyze specific content and themes with regards to sponsorship um, conversation which is what the visualization of the chart that we're looking at here um, so I'll, I'm trying to help you understand what impact you've had as a brand in shaping the overall conversation and we can apply that again to the reputation dimensions so we can understand that as a brand as a whole but also within the sponsorship specific conversation how are they stacking up um, so a hypothetical example of what we might be looking like here is if there's a sponsorship um, involving your ceo which is putting across a message of technology and innovation um, uh, and also trying to get across a message of the products and services that you offer that we can say that out of those areas of trying to intend to communicate with regards to leadership and technology yes it's been successful but there's something with regards to the products and the services which hasn't quite permeated through to the audience it might be the content and the assets specifically look to convey that message had less visibility online generated less impressions and were therefore less successful in reaching your audience or it might be simply if we're looking historically over time 
and we know the products and services in area which has been underperforming for for some time that actually the context which we can see is it's just not a message which we're going to land with the audience or certainly within the within the copy or the format of which the content was was published in when we're working with sponsorship um conversation analysis we will typically work on a ad hoc basis we'll be looking at standalone reports um, to make sure that they're falling um, or, or being delivered back into the business as soon as possible and not necessarily falling within the cadence of the regular reporting framework or we can build that into an existing um, quarterly or monthly report as a deep dive topic um, and an ad hoc and, and, and changing um, within within each period of uh, deliverables. Audience analysis, so a big part of what we do for all of our clients um so the map and the visualization you can see on the left hand side is a representation of how we approach our audience analysis so we take the audience as a whole um and the individuals being the the nodes the circles and the lines that interconnect between them the the real world or the meaningful relationships in terms of following relationships or sharing similar content our audience algorithm then pulls out the communities of interest and we're able to interpret and infer the data points which we have based on how they describe themselves, what their affinities are, what the demographic information is, to be able to say specifically what is the real world meaning behind that um, segment. So we can then overlay the audience um, segmentation on top of our um, brand reputation data. We can do so on an ongoing basis to track evolution against key segments over time. Um, or we can make comparative analysis between the two. So we've highlighted there what would have been a um, community of journalists. You can go in specifically to understand exactly who it is within that segment that's been driving the conversation, who's been picking up particular um, areas of PR or press coverage or campaigns that you're looking to uh, disseminate online or alternatively, who is shaping conversations around your brand who you're not yet aware of, who you might want to be um, working with in the future. And ultimately as well, really importantly, make a comparative analysis between different audience segmentations. So if we're working with a brand with a, a large carbon footprint, then we might see the green segmentation toward the left-hand side may represent um, climate activists. So you want to understand how those conversational themes are different in different between journalists and the climate activist. You want to understand what reputational dimensions um, they are contributing towards, and then ultimately what the overall impact is on that bigger picture overall brand um, perception again. Um, what else we can do in terms of framework? So we discussed um existing um brand dimensions and supportive behaviors is a way that we can structure the data um we can also build these frameworks up um from the from the ground up organically from the data um or we can do so based on how our clients are briefing us in in terms of what else they want to know and um, so an example here being esg topics where we're using keyword filters and the syntax to classify the data which is coming in with regards to each of these pillars um, so we can see here the pie, the column chart representing volume and the color code and the number, the reputation score, a large number of uh, posts with regards to corporate governance, which was performing well for the brand in that period. Climate change, even larger, but performing less positively. Um, so this is very much part of that uh, customized approach, which we can take to the data, um, making sure that we align with um, anything which you're looking to understand how your brand is perceived online, but also we can change this up with regards to um, specific aims or objectives that you might have. Or alternatively, we can just build this up from the ground up organically based on how people are talking about your, your brand online. And then a final example of the kind of ways of working which we can do and what we're working with a lot of clients um, at, the, at the moment. So we also have a visibility AI algorithm, um, which means that we weight individual pieces of content with regards to the impact they have had. So um, an inferred understanding of the, of the amount of eyes on the, on the content based on where it's been published, um, how um, influential that individual author or that publication is to be able to say, um, someone like myself with a low Twitter following, much less likely to be generating a high degree of visibility, 
against a, um, a journalist or someone writing in the, in the New York Times with a higher degree of visibility. So we're using the visibility algorithm on top of um, reputation scoring to be able to assess and understand um, reputational impact and build in early alert systems. So raising flags with regards to themes that are coming through on the data which may impact reputation in the future and putting that on our client's radar is something that they either want to uh, address um, directly with, with comms or something that they just want to um, put on their radar and keep um, analyze, keep an analysis framework and keep reporting on an ongoing basis uh, and measure to be able to understand is it something that is going to be continually increasing in which case we're going to be more of a need to address or is it something which is going to kind of like peter out and die down in the coming weeks and months and something which which was uh, which was nice to know about but not necessarily um something which needs needs um brand comms to address immediately and then to wrap up very quickly um, the value of the approach which we uh, have communicated, so the immediacy and the granularity analysis, so that real-time nature of the data and the tools that we're working with, as well as the granularity to be able to look at individual pieces of the content, the quality of detail and the nuance um, around online conversations, understanding not just the what, but also the why and the who, so the audiences that sit behind the data, um as well as those um those reputational dimensions uh and supported behaviors which we touched on to be able to understand what intent looks like building in early alerting systems um so we know from the work that we are doing for our clients that the always on real-time nature of how we're working can sometimes build in a lead time on quant based trackers from between three to six months meaning that the first time you're going to be notified of these um, evolutions in brand reputation is via um, social data um, contextualizing via uh, multiple data points um, so the events the drivers um, what's taking place online what's the the driving force ultimately behind the shifts in in conversations and themes retrospective exploration and benchmarking so the longer we do this work the more meaningful and impactful it becomes um, so we're able to understand what reputation looks like in uh, in this year compared to prior and we're able to understand if there's a shift in, in a specific um, reputational dimension is this something which um, has happened in the past and in which case what does that kind of like norm scale looks like and then assessing impact of comms and coverage on audience perceptions. Uh, really what we're going hard on um, in terms of delivering is being able to understand how your audience is perceiving your, your, your brand online. And that is multiple audiences across all the segmentations which we are able to understand and assess. Um, all the different stakeholders, albeit whether they are industry specific, whether they are journalists, press, PR focused, whether they are a particular advocacy group um, or whether they are your consumers or, or customers. And then that is everything from myself. Uh, I want to thank you for, for taking the time to listen to the presentation um, and very much welcome any, any questions which you, which you have with regards to the approach. Thank you, Rob, and thank you for running us so comprehensively through so many different possibilities in this space. We have hit the 33 minute mark already. We all got a little bit excited, but we're definitely going to stick around for any questions that anyone might have today. So if you missed the housekeeping spiel at the start, you're looking for the question mark icon on the right hand side of your screen. Just hit your question in there and I'll pass that over to Rob or to to Russ or to Jake or to all three of them. Um, Rob, to get us started, I wondered if you could spend a, a moment or so and, and give us some context for how this might work for different types of industries. I know that you were saying that some of that scoring and thinking can be really industry specific. And I was thinking about what does it look like in a really highly regulated space or where we're getting into a government space how does that work shift and change and adapt? Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, I'll, I'll get started on, on that and then um, I'll hand over to, to Jake potentially to, to speak to some of, some of the areas as well. Um, but how we are working for different clients in different um, industries is very important to note as well that the reputational dimensions that we're, that we're working with um, are very much tailored um, with accordance to each of our 
each of our clients um, what citizenship looks like for one client isn't going to look the same for for another in another industry um, obviously products and services are a big one that changes across um, all of our clients um, so there's that level of customization um, which which takes place to tailor those um, filters and syntax accordingly um, the reputational scoring um, system uh, is very much the the same um, it's the same normative scale. Um, we spent time testing it on, on live data over, over multiple clients. Um, so we know how to um, deploy that and we know how that works. Um, but it's definitely, um, there's a high degree of customization in terms of the approach of how we can, how we can point it in, in different areas for different clients um, within different industries. Uh, and then, um, uh, Jake, I'm not sure if you had anything you wanted to add with, with regards to the second half of that question. Yeah, just briefly. So for me, this is really powerful in two ways. The first one is the, how this, this score correlates much more closely than traditional brand tracking measurement with business metrics that matter, right? which is what we're all looking for. You know, the, the kind of metrics that we're applying here, we have to show how they are correlated and ideally leading indicators of metrics that your boards and your exec members care about. And that's, I think, even more important in those kinds of spaces that you mentioned. The other thing I'd say is the specificity of the output, particularly around audience, I think is really critical in those kinds of industries. So as we can get really granular about the reputation within a particular group of people, whether they are opinion, opinion formers or policy makers or government or something else that is applicable to that industry, I think that's really powerful to be able to deep dive and see specifically for that group and for a particular event perhaps within that group, What's the reputation? What's the impact of work that you guys are delivering and executing? And how is that then rolling back up into the overall score? Awesome. Thank you. It really um, it really jumped out to me when you were talking about reputation as not being something that can be won. It is something that is a constant, um, something to constantly measure and constantly look at what's happening. We've had a couple of questions around the frequency for this kind of measurement or how often, how much time, what, what are your thoughts around how frequently this kind of work needs to take place to have real value in an organisation? Certainly. Um, I mean, most definitely um, monthly and quarterly, um, but also quite commonly we're working on a weekly basis as well. Um, it really depends on um, the levels of um, uh, communications and activations which a brand is pushing online to which they're wanting to understand um, how quickly the the audience is is uh, is, is picking up on um, and how, how that audience perception is changing. Um, but definitely on a on a weekly basis, we found in the past to be a value for a lot of our clients, even if there isn't um, a huge amount of fluctuation on a week by week basis. Specifically, if what you're looking to get is that early alerting um, mm -hmm. view, um, then the much more higher frequency. Um, and picking up on much more smaller um, fluctuations in those metrics and those scorings can be a value add for our for our clients. Yeah, and ju just to build on that, I, I totally agree with what Rob said there, and I think that the kind of the regularity of the output and the frequency of it um, is really critical, but, and that it's important that that ties in with the operational cadence of the business that we're in, and we can make sure that we do that. You know, whether it's weekly, monthly, quarterly, whatever, maybe best but i also think it's really important to make sure that you know we don't just wait for those those periods to report you know we'll report when there is a particular event if there's something coming up that is of relevance that we know is coming or even if it just happens overnight and catches everyone by surprise we can move super quickly and give that kind of report and understand the impact you know, almost immediately and i think that's really what's really powerful here and that's the kind of functionality you don't get in traditional brand and reputation trackers which have that kind of you know survey cadence to them Mm, thank you. I'm keeping an eye on the question area and also keeping an eye on the time and I know we want to wrap up shortly so now is an excellent time to add in any extra questions that you wanted to ask any of the panellists today but Russ I'll throw to you for anybody on, on the call today who is interested about adding this kind of work to their toolkit what are your recommended next steps for anyone who's feeling really impatient after listening to this conversation today? 
yeah, I hope you're feeling excited and impatient all at the same time, um, because that's uh, that's what we're doing here, right? Is is, uh, is building up this awareness, and we want to be able to to be helping uh, Icentia clients uh, right across Australia and, and New Zealand and 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 all of APAC really to to be able to unlock these new capabilities. So I definitely suggest that you uh, start the conversation with your account management team around how we can we can make this work for you. Um, obviously, with with any uh, with any um, merger of this scale, we're going through lots of integration discussions around how we can bring Pulse, um, platforms like Pulsar and, and Vulio and Response Force to the fingertips of, of Icentia clients, but from a from a brand reputation, from a from a research perspective, we can start those conversations and, and get going right now. So yeah, please do get in touch with your account management team. Awesome. Yeah, we've had a couple of questions just around does Icentia offer this as part of the existing suite of monitoring, which I think you've just answered there, that reaching out yeah. to that account management team is the next best step. And for anyone who has asked if a webinar recording is available today, yes, definitely. That'll be sent through to you either later today or tomorrow and we'll also share information about the next webinars in this series all about the possibilities with Pulsar. So some of the sessions that you'll see coming up are focusing on things like social listening in times of crisis communications and looking at some horizon scanning and stakeholder management as well. So we'll keep you tuned on those next sessions but thank you so much for spending part of your Tuesday with us. Have an excellent rest of your day. See you later, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, guys.